Classic Restos, proudly brought to you by Shannon's, where you can be part of the Shannon's Club, Penrite Oil, Hare and Forbes Machinery House, Pace Farm and Duncan Foster Engineering. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another exclusive Classic Restos here in Detroit. This trip is thanks to Shannon's. In the realms of keeping you entertained and blown away with incredible content, I think that you'll find this next segment of the show quite amazing. But first, some important commercials from people that are not only great to deal with, but help to keep Classic Restos happening each and every week. It's thanks to Shannon's. Ask about multi-policy discounts and sign up for the Shannon's Club. Call 134646 for a quote and see more at shannons.com.au. For oils, coolants, additives and technical assistance, oil right, use Penrite. And Heron Forbes has the range. Buy online at machineryhouse.com.au. There is no question that Detroit is the epicentre for automotive history and excitement. I'm about to take you through this door and when I take you into this next section there are no words to explain what you are about to see. Thanks to exclusive Classic Restos contacts in Detroit I bring you this in an environment of if you will, automotive eeriness. For as long as most people have been alive, so have a number of classic cars kept under wraps. This is almost like an Area 51 of secrecy until now. Some people of Detroit own a unique collection of historic automobiles. They have been donated over the years by the auto companies their executives and other parties interested in the history of the auto industry. These vehicles are in the perpetual care of the Detroit Historical Society. Some of the cars are periodically loaned out to auto museums around the country, while the balance of the collection is stored in a warehouse at historic Fort Wayne in Detroit. Each vehicle is housed in its own protective, environmentally controlled, clear plastic bubble. As a result of these unusual circumstances, many Detroiters, let alone people outside of the United States, have never seen or even heard of the collection. You are seeing a number of extraordinary cars, and some of them are priceless. An air of legend seems to surround the cars, something approaching urban folklore perhaps. In the meantime, here's a very small sample of this amazing bubble car collection. Oh, wow, wow, and more wow. They're the three words that hit me so far. We have Dave Marchioni. Now, Dave is the automotive curator here at Fort Wayne, the bubble cars. Dave, welcome. Thanks for coming down. It's really exciting to have you here, Fletch. Dave, uh, thank you. <laughs> it just keeps on bowling me over uh, what is around uh, and sharing on Classic Restos. Now, the first car behind me, we have a 1963, a Mustang II. Tell us about this car, Dave. It's a Ford prototype. It's the last one before they went into production with the Mustang. It's a really amazing piece of automotive history. It's a 289 four-speed with a chop top, was built in the Ford Styling Studios, and unrestored. It's been, li it's been here since the late 80s. Dave, I can't believe the styling here on this Mustang too. The shape of that front nose cone. That would have been all hand-formed in the Ford Styling Studios in steel. It's really an amazing piece. How many? They're looking at it. That's a sum total of one car produced. There you go, right behind us. This is so surreal, you've got to pinch yourself. Can that be happening? I mean, is that, is that thing here? Fletch, we don't do this for everybody, but because you and Classic Restos have come so far, how'd you like to take that one out of the bag? You are kidding me. I wouldn't kid you about that. It's pretty serious car stuff. Uh, how long has it been since the bag's been taken off that car? Every now and again, but we don't take them out often, for sure. 
I mean, 1963, here in front of me, just two metres away, it's, it's extraordinary. What's the feeling that you get when you walk around here, Dave? Uh, I've been with the museum for almost 15 years now, and it still amazes me, the content of our collection and the cars. And You can't be a car guy and not be completely awestruck by these cars. It, it, it's just an amazing piece of history. Oh, okay, on we go to the next one. Hey, Dave, what a testament to Cadillac. 1987, a Cadillac wagon. What's the story with this? It's a really unique piece. Uh, the wagon you see in front of you is one of only two factory-produced Cadillac station wagons. Okay, now in the past, Cadillac uh, had coach bodybuilders do wagons, right? So this is, this is from the factory. Absolutely. Our Clark Street plant here in Detroit, they were getting ready to shut it down, and the UAW rank and file got together and assembled four cars to try and show Cadillac they could make different items here that would be available to the public and sell. They made two station wagons, a hearse, and a limousine. All four of them are here in our collection. It's amazing. They, they would have looked at retooling and everything to, to get that back section right, the trouble that they went to for the, for the four cars, and, and they, I can't get my head around that. That's amazing. Yeah, well, it's really a testament to the UAW. They, they really saw the value of the plant and the, trying to preserve all those jobs for the local guys, and they really worked at trying to make these marketable. And I think, you know, time would only tell, but I'd like to think that if they'd have made them, people would have bought them. It's a really cool piece. Did the four cars mode, did it help? Uh, there's no telling, unfortunately. They still close the plant. Um, that They were at least had enough forthright to think to save these vehicles for us, so we have these four pieces of history here. Wow. Just initiative at the plant to have a red hot go and try and save the plant. That's, uh, yeah, it's tug at the heartstring stuff, that isn't it? It is. And from the stories that we've heard, it was all done after hours and on private time. And it was really kind of a clandestine effort to try and make this work. Upper management didn't know? Allegedly not. Uh, obviously, I wasn't there. I didn't work there. But some of the stories that we've had retold of that were that it was done completely without the knowledge of upper management. <laughs> Dave, I'm just blown away by this. Uh, what an incredible vehicle. Um, to think it's just sitting behind us once again, it's, it's just extraordinary. Talk about tug at the heartstring stuff. A 1987 Cadillac Fleetwood just stopped when the, when the factory closed. Everybody walked out. This is how far this particular car progressed, and it's still to this day just how it was left. Yeah, it's kind of a time capsule. It would have stopped when the production line stopped and everything was moved out. Uh, again, we were, we were gifted a bunch of things by GM, and this car was one of them, and it's still in the factory wrappers, has the factory build sheet on the floor, it still has all the factory stickers in the windows. That's it, like, you know, the, the bell would have gone off, that's it, everyone walked away. Yeah, very much so. I, I would have loved to have known exactly how it went down, but unfortunately, again, because we weren't there, we're not sure exactly how it finished. Dave, it must have finished fast, because they didn't complete the car. Like, I mean, when uh, usually when uh, uh, production lines close down, the last vehicle is finished. Just to walk out and leave it mid-finished, that's, that's amazing. And it could have been, it, there could have been a negotiation, uh, there could have been an 11th hour thing where they were negotiating and then when everything stopped, they just never picked back up. You know, isn't this amazing stuff? Where else would you see this? Uh, and to see that car too, by the way, well, we look in there and it's all brand new and you see the plastic and, oh wow, talk about winding the clock back. Um, it just looks so nice, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's an OEM brand new 87 Cadillac Fleetwood. You are watching the incredible bubble car collection here in Detroit, and I know that you're seeing it first on Classic Restos. Back with more right after this. I spend a lot of time out here. The RT Charger's the real deal. An E49. Remember A Charger? I've always got projects on the go, so Shannon's laid up cover helps protect my restorations. I'm Mopar through and through. It's a passion Shannon's understands. I wouldn't insure my cars and bikes with anyone else. Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Call 13 46 46 for a quote. Penrite, Australian made, family owned and operated. Make premium quality engine and racing oils, warranty approved coolants, automatic transmission and manual gear oils, a complete range of engine and fuel additives, heavy duty and industrial products for every application. Visit penrideoil.com for more information. Penrite, Australian made for Australian conditions since 1926. If you have a restoration project, Hair and Forbes has the tools that you need. Look at these restoration products. Shrinker stretchers, dollies, mallets, bead rollers, profile gauges, professional panel restoration kits, and so much more. Now I warn you, enter at your own risk because you will end up buying something. 
So come along to your Cap City store or browse and buy online at machineryhouse.com.au because Heron Forbes has the range. Moving through as we do, uh, well, as you would, uh, where bubble cars are on display. Uh, Dave, uh, to my left, what's the story here? It's a really neat piece, Fletch. It's a Ford styling study called the Cobra II. Ford bought an AC Cobra chassis, imported it to here to Dearborn, stripped it of all its body panels, and then built that body on top of it. It's a vacuum-formed, soybean-based plastic body in 1963. Sounds like you can eat it. Uh, pretty close, I would imagine, although I don't think you'd want to eat it after this long in a bubble. No, you'd want it uh, on simmer for a while, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, at least it's fresh because it's wrapped, right? Oh, just, <laughs> this is, it's, it's almost half a joke. I didn't know it was going to turn into the Classic Resto's Chef Edition. Well, whatever we got to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, amazing. Uh, again, it's an episode where you can spend a lot of time on each car, but because there's so many in here, speaking of which, around 70? We have a total of about 70 cars. There's about 50 that are here right now. We rotate them out to different collections. Okay, well, we're just going to keep on going through and show you as many as we possibly can. All right, Dave, on we go, huh? Away we go. People movers are just so big today. They're just so popular. But uh, you guys uh, here in the United States were building these things back in the 40s. Now, you might have heard of a beetle. This is a scarab, right? That's right, Fletch. It's a stout scarab. Uh, basically, if you look at it in the abstract, it's kind of the predecessor to the modern minivan that we have here. Okay, so how many of these were built? It's one of those things, there's not an exact number. They made them over a period of years. And there was a couple prototypes that were available, but this is one of the last running, driving, complete examples of the Stout Scarab. And how long has this been here, approximately? Uh, I believe it's been in our collection since the 60s. Unbelievable, isn't it? Um, just to think that uh, something so old is so well preserved, and that's the whole, the whole point of the, these bubbles here. Um, who had it? I don't know that off the top of my head. What we get with a lot of times is families will give collections after somebody's passed away. Uh, if your father had this and you knew it meant a lot to him yeah. and the pres historic preservation of it mattered to him, then giving it to a museum is not a bad idea if you don't have the means or the interest in keeping it and repairing it. Well, there's a family still walking because their vehicle's here. There you go. It stays in history. You know, that's, uh, you can still come out and enjoy it when it's out on display. We've actually just put it back into storage from a long-term display at our museum. What do we say about a vehicle like this? A 1940s people mover. Look at the styling of it. When you look at it, it looks almost European. Up here, the windscreen, it's like a couple of eye sockets, and this rib here on the rake, it's like that part of your nose. It's kind of like got its own face. Look at the die cast around the front of the headlights here. Being a scarab as well, it's got the picture of the insect right in the front there. One thing that gets me about this is the length of the wheelbase, which would suggest that it rides quite nice. And up the back, what powers it? Would you believe, of course, this is the giveaway tail that is made in the United States of America because we have a side valve Ford Flathead V8. The thing would sound half decent as well. Again, depicted from the scarab, look at the engine cowling. It opens out like a pair of wings. This is a, an extraordinary vehicle. Inside the people mover, a whole new experience would have awaited you back in 1940. It makes quite a few people comfortable. It has a fold-down table. It's got bucket seats in the front and a one-spoke steering wheel. I don't know what the advantages of that would have been, but I guess it looked pretty aerodynamic and pretty classy back in the time. Are the seats adjustable? You bet. Not only are they adjustable, you can physically just move them around to whatever position you want to put them in. Here we go, time for another revelation. We're going to get this baby, we're going to pop it out of its bag. What are we looking at here, Dave? It's a 1963 Cougar II prototype car. Wow. Again, just one? Just one, built in the styling studio at Ford on a Cobra chassis. Really a unique piece. Wow, goodness me. They must have, when they, they signed off on them, they designed these things, built them. Then, I wonder if they realized that all these decades down the track, where it would end up. Makes you wonder, because it went through a pretty heavy approval process. It would have had to have gone from a drawing to a clay to a, before they actually built this car. So it's a pretty heavy approval process for something to get this far in production. Yeah. Okay, now the uh, styling of the car too, I mean, uh, so many, uh, you can see European styling in this. I mean, um, although it's American designed and made, you can just see the different lines and uh, some European styling there. For sure. It's got a lot of the styling of that era. It's got the, the fastback look to it. It's got the really beautiful character lines on the body. This one carries the, wire, the real true wire wheels. It really, really looks like a sports car of that day. It really a glorious look. Absolutely. And around the back there, I mean, and, uh, you know, even Corvette is not out of the picture. 
No, if you, if you put a split in that back window, it's pretty reminiscent of that Corvette. So it's, you know, I think everybody was kind of feeling the same European vibe in sports car at that time. When we look inside the interior, it screams, sit in me and take me for a drive. I mean, it's got the low back buckets, it's the stick shift, round instrumentation. It, it screams the 60s, but it's performance, it's style, there's just a lot of class going on. Yeah, it's a lot of the Grand Prix look of that era. If you think about that time, it was the glory years of uh, Grand Prix and Monaco and all of that style of racing. Mm. And that was starting to translate from the 50s when it first started into that generation of cars. Now, Dave, through your eyes, you're an experienced guy hanging around these cars. You're heavily involved in a lot of auctions. Had this been mass produced, how do you think it would have gone? Well, it's always tricky to, to guess that, but you know, it's a really pretty car. And you look at how some of the other cars of that era sold. The Corvettes were a huge hit. Mm. Uh, they sold a lot of XKEs and E-types over here, so i got to believe there'd be a market for that car. It's absolutely stunning. It's beyond words. It really is, and I think this is the only one in the world right here. You know, in 2017, why not reward yourself with a Fletch Tour? Have a look at this. There is nothing quite like a Fletch Tour. Carlisle or Ford Nationals, GM Nationals and Chrysler Nationals await you. Book a Fletch Tour. It's amazing. We've seen some absolutely amazing cars. What an event. Experience Route 66 from Chicago to Vegas or choose the Detroit Tour. I would make it a point to go to Fletch Tours and come to Detroit. There are five Fletch Tours. Select the one that suits you best. See FletchTours.com or contact All Things Travel, Lara. Every weekend around Australia, motoring enthusiasts get together to share their passion for cars and bikes. It's a passion that brings us together. All sorts of people. All sorts of cars and bikes. From the classics of today to the classics of tomorrow. At Shannon's, we understand enthusiasts. So when it comes to insurance, it's got to be Shannon's. Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Call 13 46 46 for a quote. In 1926, Australia's Penrite Oil Company was established. Almost 90 years of research, development and refining under the harsh Australian conditions has made Penrite Oil what it is today. Precision, performance, reliability and protection. Championship winning products. Trust Penrite. Heron Forbes Machinery House has been family owned and operated for over 85 years and it's easy to see why. And with a range like this, you cannot go wrong. Planning on welding? Look at these welding tables and clamps, air compressors and different air tools, sandblasting cabinets, through to spray guns. Everyone is welcome at Machinery House and they're also open Saturday mornings. Their range of machine tools are workshop tested. There are competitive freight rates around Australia and you can buy online at machinerywhouse.com.au. So remember, Hare and Forbes has the range. Well, well, 1973, Lee Iacocca's car. The big guy at Ford, the top man. Here it is. Tell us more, Dave. It's really an interesting piece, Fletch. It's, if you think about that time, it was at a time when that car would have gone down the line and everybody that worked on it knew that it was the president's car. So you could, he could walk down the line at any moment just to keep his eye on production as well. Absolutely, because a lot of the guys were at Wixom when these cars were being produced, particularly early in model launches. Yeah. So rest assured, that car was very well tended when it went down the line. I mean, they, they, possibly they could have even been nervous working on that. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you knew that your boss's personal car was coming past you, I bet you put all the rivets and tightened everything really carefully. And, yeah. and at any time you're going to make a mistake, if you were ever going to make one, it was probably going to be then because of being under so much pressure perhaps. Yeah, well, like I said, it's understood with the UAW guys. It, it, it wasn't unheard of to walk cars down the line then, just to make sure that, that an executive's car or somebody that you knew's car got its proper attention. The big Lincoln Mark IV, 460 V8 up front. Now, color scheme, obviously, for Lee. Tell us about the interior. Uh, it's an interesting car because it went down the production line, but it's got a pearl white, which would not have been factory in a pearl white then. Again, being Iacocca's car, it's got an interior in different colors, but in the original interior pattern. So it looks like a stock interior, but it's in colors that weren't offered in Lincoln. So not only was it Leo Kaka's Ford, I mean, it's, it's a car that is a one-off, one-off production, the only one in the world 
even that, I mean, the accolades there, I mean, it just gets better and better, doesn't it? Well, you could certainly argue that it was coach built down an assembly line. Because right. the, the pinstriping is hand done by Frank Galley, who's a local pinstriper who still pinstripes today. Mm -hmm. It's got aftermarket wheels on it. It would have had a little bit of extra attention. Now, Dave, things didn't end all that well in 1978 for, for Lee. Well, it's the joy of being an executive, I suppose. Uh, he, was, he was notorious for having arguments with superiors, even in moving the Mustang through and everything. But he'd built a career in a prominence that let him get away with a little bit. But he ended up with an argument with Henry Ford that ended with Henry saying, well, it's my name on the building. And it's hard to argue with that. Pardon the pun, but I don't want to burst your bubble. But every vehicle in here is inside one to preserve it. I'm just a little surprised that this Yale forklift truck hasn't made the grade. The crown jewel of the collection, in my opinion. And especially if you're feeling down, this particular vehicle can give you a bit of a lift. From one president's car to another, wow, we represent a different era now. This is Billy Durant's car. Billy Durant founded General Motors, and this was his Cadillac. This is, this is amazing, Dave. It's a really cool piece, Fletch. It's the first closed-bodied Cadillac produced in Detroit. What year are we talking? Roughly 1905, because it was originally built and then rebodied. So it's well over 100 years old, carries all the original carriage work. As you look at it, it looks a lot more like a, like a motorized carriage. It's, it's early in development. So it's really before cars had transitioned into their own entity. It's a big glass square box. It's like as you wait for Superman to jump out of it, you know. Uh, it looks a lot like a phone booth. There's no arguing that. But, it, but it's an interesting piece, and in the, in the scope of Detroit history, it's, a, it's really a cool thing to have in our here in the collection. I mean, to go through all these years and it's still here, I mean, anything could have, I guess the same thing could be said to all of these vehicles, but the older it is, it's the price of rarity. I mean, anything could have happened to this over all these many decades. Sure, there's been a num numerous, there was the incident at the Corvette Museum a couple of years ago that they lost some cars in, it happens. It's, yeah. it's the unfortunate circumstance of life. You know, yeah. things happen that we don't always have control of. Yeah. The fact that these things are still here with us is something we work really hard to preserve. I mean, haven't they come a long way? I mean, really, we're talking uh, motorized horse-drawn carriages here. I mean, it's uh, that, that era, isn't it? I mean, we've got some nice upholstery, very sparse on the inside, of course, by today's standards. A couple of pedals on the floor, that's it. Little engine out front. A couple of lights there that were probably like candles back in the day. But being Billy Durant's car, um, obviously five star all the way for him. Yeah, it's, it's funny when you think of the perspective of that car in history. And even working in history, when I'm standing in front of it, looking at it, and thinking that at some point in its life, Durant was in and out of that and took it around Detroit. And the things that car has gone through and seen, yeah. it's really staggering if you have any sense of the history of it. It's amazing, too, to think that the, uh, the big screen in front, I mean, we're not talking uh, laminated screens, the roads they had to drive on, it's a wonder they just didn't shatter and fall out. Yeah, you look at the size of the glass in that car, and it's considerable for something that would have been largely unpaved roads. Mm. You know, we get four seasons in Michigan, so it goes from freeze to thaw to soup to packed. The fact that it's intact in any sense of the word is, is nothing short of staggering. I guess the soup wouldn't be too bad, but uh, the others, well, you know, you can, you can have that. Well, I don't know about road soup. It doesn't sound like very appetizing to me, Fletch, but whatever works for you. Okay. Dave, I'd like to take this opportunity to round off today's episode. Uh, it's a little sad, really. I don't want to go. I want to stay here. You have been absolutely uh, fantastic to interview, a wealth of information, and I'd like to thank you and the entire team here uh, to allow us in for this exclusive, this special episode of Classic Restos here in Detroit. Thanks, Dave. Thank you so much for coming, and it's a pleasure having you here. Well... I have to say that that is one of the most interesting episodes that I've ever filmed for Classic Restos. The history here and just the mystique of these cars hiding under these bubble wraps is absolutely amazing. I'm sure you'll agree that Dave was a wealth of information and helped tie in this episode to make it even extra special. The return trip to Detroit is also a special thanks to Shannon's. As I say at the end of every show, until next week, no matter where you're watching from, please ride and drive safe. I'm Fletch, and I thank you very much for watching. You can like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash classic restos TV and watch catch up episodes at shannons.com.au. Classic Restos, proudly brought to you by Shannons, where you can be part of the Shannons Club, Penrite Oil, Hair and Forbes Machinery House, Pace Farm, and Duncan Foster Engineering.